Welcome to the Down South Hunting Podcast. I'm Adam Cruz with Mike Higman. Tonight we're going to be talking with Tony Smotherman, the traveling hunter. Tony is a Tennessee native. He is a hunting nut, an all-around good guy, and I am just going to bet that you're going to love this episode tonight. Before we get started, though, how are you doing? Man, I'm doing good. I'm so glad to have power back. You know, you go without power for a few days, you really appreciate what you've been missing. So, um, I think we, I ended up without power for, it was, went out Sunday night and we got it back Friday night. Um, the good thing is my wife and kids were out of town that whole time. I kind of sent them out of town to evacuate while I got the house ready. Um, so I appreciate having power back. Life's getting back to normal here. Um, it was kind of crazy for a while there just trying to get the house ready and then unget the house ready. I, I hadn't prepared ahead to have shutters for the house already yet. Um, so I had to like make them in within two days and I actually tore the kids tree house down to steal the wood. Uh, I kept putting it off because I was thinking, you know, they always turn then, uh, Sunday morning, I think it was, and it was supposed to hit like sun Sunday night, Monday morning time frame. Um, the track was like showing it go over my house. So I was like, really like time to get the work done. So I ended up getting it all ready, and then it turned, and of course didn't hit us, which, uh, you know, thank God for that. I'm glad it didn't. Um, but, yeah, did did some craziness trying to get it ready. So, But life's, life's back to normal. Um, so that's good. Well, man, I'm glad to hear that you made it okay, and, you know, we were able to communicate during that time a little bit. And just I didn't want to bother you too much, but I was a little bit concerned about you. I don't know that I could do all the podcasting without mics. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I wasn't going to die for sure, but my house might have had some serious damage. I might have been out of, out of commission for a little bit. It went without internet for a little bit, but life was okay. So, you know, I say how bad it was without power. It wasn't really that bad. I didn't even have a generator, but um, the only bad part was trying to sleep at night with no AC. That's that's the only thing I'll whine about. So, uh, But everything else was okay, you know, stayed busy. And, of course, I had the truck. So if I ever had to get, you know, got real hot, just go out and truck and enjoy some AC in there. So um, it was all good. And, uh, of course, we had we just finished a series on, on scent control, and uh, that was really cool to do. But I'm excited about kind of getting back to our normal gig a little bit and being able to chat a little bit and see what's been going on. Uh, what have you been up to the last couple of weeks? Uh, you know, just the regular family stuff and then also preparing for bow season. Bow season actually kicked off this past weekend in Tennessee, and I've uh, I found some really good areas that are public land, water access only. I've got a friend now that has a boat, so, you know, if I want to, I can either catch a ride with him or I can float in on my kayak and found some really good spots, but it was, it was 90 degrees on Saturday and Sunday, so... I just kind of set that one out and it's going to, the temp's going to drop down into the seventies this weekend. So I'm going to kind of check with the family, make sure there's nothing going on. And if there's not, then I'm definitely going to try to get in one sit this weekend on one of those areas on a, on some public land. I'm really excited about that. Just trying something new this year, especially really close to home. And you know, that's, that's the main thing been going on in my life other than the normal work, the work drudgery. Man, that sounds that sounds pretty cool. So I'm really interested in hearing about that. Have you now have you been to these spots at all and scouted them or you're just going to like go in blind and hunt them? How's that going to go? You know, I've been to a few of them. It's really hard to get to most of these because it is water access only. So what me and my buddy we've done is, you know, took his boat and went up to some of these areas where I try to find pinch points between mainland and an island. And a lot of times with these mainland um, you know, the water access there, it gets really shallow. I'm talking one foot or less to get to the Island. And it looks like these deer are going from the mainland across that shallow point right onto these islands. And it's just, I mean, it's the perfect ambush area and I'm probably not going to hunt right there, but you can get into these islands a little bit deeper and it literally looks like cows live on oh, these yeah. islands. The, the trails are so beaten down, but you know, it's going to be different because if you go in at the wrong time, obviously you can bust them. And if you bust them off this island, they're gone. That's it. So learning how to hunt this area, when to hunt it, how to hunt it, 
getting in and out quietly to make sure I don't bump anything. I think it's going to be a learning curve. So I don't have my, uh, my sight set too high or any like goals or expectations is, you know, go out there and learn as much as I can and, and try to have fun with it this year, just doing something new. But yeah. I'm excited about hearing that. Is this, when you're looking at aerials, can you see deer trails and is that that type of terrain or is it get straight into hardwoods where you can't tell? It's so thick. Yeah. Some of these areas, I mean, you're like busting brush to get in it. That's what I'm a little concerned about as far as when we, you know, park the boat or park my kayak is like actually getting in and through some of that uh, thick canopy that you kind of got to brush, get through. So that could be a little more challenging and just finding some holes. Maybe I go in there with a machete each time and clear it out a little bit before at least November and stuff. Yeah. Well, Hopefully our guest Tony can give you some good tips as to to how to hunt this spot. And uh, I actually went hunting the first time this weekend. So maybe after we interview Tony, we'll get back together and I'll, I'll talk about that because we need to get him on the line. What do you think? Let's do it. I'll give him a call. Tony, thanks for taking the time to jump on the call today. We have looked forward to doing this for a long time and... A few years ago, I actually had the opportunity to meet Tony at a Bass Pro event. Bass Pro was putting on some kind of event where, you know, they had pro staffers from different companies coming in and they were uh, bringing in, I think it was like one of their fall specials. Anyways, Tony was kind of by himself for whatever reason. There just wasn't anyone flowing through Bass Pro at that time. It might have been early in the morning. And I just had a few minutes or heck, it seemed like a lot longer than that. Maybe we sit there and talked for an hour, but I just got to kind of quiz you on you know, who you were in the industry. I wasn't that familiar with you at that point. And you had got to talking to, to me, asking me about, you know, what I was doing hunting wise. And I was telling you, you know, I'm driving two and a half hours South. A lot of times, most, most of the time to do a lot of my hunting. And you said, you just looked at me all dead serious. And you said, you're driving two and a half hours South and you could drive two and a half hours North and be in Western Kentucky or Illinois. You might want to rethink that. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can start a piece of blunt. I guess no. I was confused. <laughs> you you changed my thinking completely on how I go about like uh, preparing for places to deer hunt because I was always thinking you know hunting close to home doing this doing that and I guess I was a little apprehensive or or maybe even timid about getting out of my comfort zone and and ever since we've had that conversation all I have done is poured over maps and state regulations and DNR websites and going on different types of trips. And you know what? I've just enjoyed my hunting experience so much more since we've had that conversation. So you probably more than anyone have had that big of influence on, you know, how I hunt today. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate you spending the time talking with me that day. Well, man, I appreciate the kind comments. I'll tell you, um, you know, this great country they live in here, man, has so many amazing places uh, to go hunt. And, and of course, again, like I mentioned earlier there, um, maybe when we was talking off air there, um, I, I grew up in Middle Tennessee on a family farm and uh, didn't even start out deer hunting uh, until I was, man, a uh, young teenager, uh, maybe 15-ish, till I had met some boys that were, were deer hunting pretty strong in, in the school I was at. And I... Like a lot of people, of course, this, this era that we're in now, uh, folks don't do that anymore, but coon hunting uh, was very strong here in, in Middle Tennessee for years, and uh, my dad was uh, a world champion coon hunter from back in the 60s, and he eat, sleep, eat, slept, and breathe uh, coon hunting to, to the point that we had 25 or 30 walker coon hounds behind my dad's house my whole life, um, and it wasn't until I I don't know, like I said, maybe I got in high school there that I ran into some boys there that were talking about bow hunting, and, and I really didn't know anything about deer hunting at the time, but they, they were talking about being archers and, you know, how kids are. They maybe talk a little bigger than what they actually were doing, but it sounded really cool to me and something I never experienced and and just kind of dug into it uh, just for a sheer fact of I had good buddies in high school that were doing it, and it was all new to me. And, uh, man, since that time, I have... I've been all over this great land from Newfoundland to New Zealand and British Columbia and Alaska and, and pretty much every place in between. And there's so many awesome opportunities out there for Hunter if he just has, a, uh, I guess, a little bit of an open palate to, to travel just a little bit. Just no different than you. You know, we, we were talking at Bass Pro uh, there and you were hunting south maybe or, or around yep. your home there in Tennessee. But, yep. you know, 
Illinois and Western Kentucky is just right, right down the street, basically. Um, and, and they have, not that Tennessee doesn't have a lot of great hunting. We do have a lot of great hunting, and it's getting better. Obviously, we, we shot a, you know, a world record muzzleloader deer uh, uh, north of Nashville last year, and, and there's been some really great deer uh, shot in the state over the years. But uh, just uh, age structure is a little better in Kentucky. And, and though when you get into Illinois, you get to a different genetic structure of whitetail that are just naturally bigger, um, not to mention they got great food source. So, yeah, man, I'm glad you expanded your palate a little bit and, and, and looked some other places because it, it really is some awesome opportunities out there. Yep, and uh, I got to ask you this. This is a little bit off topic of where I wanted to take this conversation, but you mentioned that you did a lot of coon hunting. Um, do you, you don't do any more coon hunting now, do you? Did you get out of that? You know, you know, I, I haven't in a long time, man. Unfortunately, the gentleman... The man who got me into hunting that got me into coon hunting most of my younger years, uh, my father, uh, my dad, he passed away this past Christmas, uh, and that kind of ended the coon hunting era, you know, that, that era of folks uh, that he was with, you know, the, uh, I don't know, maybe baby, eh, maybe baby boomer era, but either way, that era of gentlemen there, and not to mention here in Middle Tennessee, uh, we don't grow farms anymore, we don't grow crops anymore. Uh, farms grow houses now so uh, the ability to get out and, and be a coon hunter in the area that I live in is pretty much slim and none because everybody uh, this day and time owns 10 acres and of course you know you you got a coon hound and they're going to get on a uh, well uh, occasionally could get on a deer and run across the neighbor's property then you got problems and it just just our area is not coon hunter friendly anymore so no, no. long-winded answer to that question is no unfortunately I, I do not well, we had that in common, and I did not realize that, but my dad also, uh, growing up, that's, and still, I think to this day, that's what he would prefer to do is, is the coon hunt. So I grew up, you know, chasing the coon dogs through the woods, and just uh, as one of my earliest memories of, of hunting is chasing walker coon hounds, and we never had 25 coon dogs, thankfully, because I don't think I could handle that, but yeah, it was, yeah, uh, I had to good feed water them rascals every day. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a little, a little fact here, and of course, I'm kind of bragging on my dad, and, uh, but in 19, okay, so pre-1969, coon hunting as a competition sport was a segregated sport, no different than segregation uh, amongst human beings back in the day was. So in a, in a national coon hunting competition, females were not allowed to compete in a national coon hunting or national sanctioned event like the Little World Hunt or the World Hunt, which still goes on today. But in 1969, they changed uh, that, that rule, that regulation in, in uh, the American Coon Hunters Association. So in 1969 was the first time a female was ever allowed to compete. And in 1969, my dad won the world hunt uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, with a female dog called Sundown Sally. So in 1969, my dad won the world hunt the first time ever a female was allowed to compete. Uh, and for years, he was on a cover of uh, the American Cooner. I don't know if you're yep. familiar with that or not, but that was yep, a, a, a that. coon hunting publication. Uh, but yeah, so uh, it's kind of a cool fact about my dad, but he... Um, he was a coon hunter through and through, you know, the stuff that I have done over the last 20 years and, and, you know, hunting everything I can, anything I can get attacked for. Basically he, he just didn't have the patience for it, man. He loved dogs. He loved listening to hounds run. That was his thing, you know? And, uh, but he, even maybe just back a little bit more when I was a kid, I remember coon hunting it when I was four years old and my job as a young person in the timber, uh, I had to have a, a pocket full of bunny bread sacks, a sharp pocket knife, and a weed light. And my job at the end of that hunt, whenever the dogs treat a coon, was they would shoot the coon out, coon obviously in season, but they would shoot the coon out. And as soon as that coon would hit the ground, my job was to go in and start skinning that coon and, and uh, harvesting the pelt off of that and putting one pelt in each bunny bread sack that I had in my pocket. Because uh, that's how we, that we substituted our income. Uh, back in, of course, uh, back in the 70s. Now, oh my gosh, that sounds makes me sound old. <laughs> back in the 70s, um, uh, that's how we supplemented uh, our income was with coon pelts, and, and a really good coon skin back then would bring $25. Uh, and in time, we hunted every night of the season, which would be months on end. We would have a freezer stocked full of coon pelts, would bring thousands of dollars. 
Um, so wow. it was a it was a cool thing back in the day. Just just obviously, unfortunately, it's just kind of an era gone by. Yeah, like you said, it's hard to find places to go, and you start stepping on landowners' toes if you start running across their property. It's just it's a different time altogether for sure. Absolutely, absolutely, man. Adam, we oh. talked about doing a <laughs> podcast on coon hunting. This is this makes me want to do that even more. We need to get some coon hunters. I, I, I'm just impressed. There's a magazine out there called American Cooner. <laughs> there is, and uh, still in print today. Uh, there is an, uh, another. One. So that's a there's American Coon Hunters Association, and then there's one called PKC, which is Professional Kennel Club, um, and they also have a publication. But but yeah, there's still coon hunters out there. Just uh, the ones that I hear of and know of more now or uh, or up in the Midwest where there's still big tracts of ground where there's lots of cornfields, which obviously coons love to be around cornfields and uh, things like that. But, uh, yeah, it would be, it'd be an interesting show, I think. Did you ever hunt down in Wayne County by any chance? Man, I tell you, we hunted all over. Uh, at that time when I was doing it, I didn't know one county from another because <laughs> I was just yeah. a younger fella. Yeah. Uh, we went wherever Dad said, let's go. Um, I, my, my favorite trip of the year, every year, we go to Parsons, Tennessee, to the St. Jude's Benefit Coon Hunt. And mm -hmm. that right there was an annual event for me and my dad. And we go, and again, this was 70, so we didn't have a great ton of money. We would pull up in the parking lot at the St. Jude Benefit Coon Hunt, and, and we would sleep. Uh, we would sleep underneath the truck every night instead of going to get in a hotel. We'd just pull up a, a, a sleeping bag and sleep under the, the 1979 Ford truck that my dad drove all the time. That's awesome. But that was that was the good days, man. <laughs> That's, it's, hey, and Parsons is still a pretty happening place. I guess uh, my little, my youngest brother, the last competition hunt I went to, I went and watched him, and I, that was probably eight, ten years ago, and it was still, it was a circus around Parsons. I mean, that that's still a big event that they put on. Oh, I guarantee you, man, and I, 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 every time that comes up, I, I, of course, just gives me just a, a rush of amazing memories that me and my dad had going down there every year. So, yeah, definitely a cool place, cool time, too, back then. Well, how did you get this nickname, Traveling Hunter? Did you come up with that, or was that kind of tagged on you? Or how'd that come about? Well, you know, when you hang around, you got different buddies, you know, they'll end up throwing a nickname on you for some reason. And, man, you know... We talked about when I was 13, 14, 15, my, my ways were changing just a little bit. No different than any uh, any other uh, guy or girl at that age. You know, your body's changing, man, hormones is coming on. You you don't know if you're pitching or catching. You know, there's a lot of things going on. And, um, unfortunately, uh, when I got around that crowd of guys that, that was teaching me how to be an archer and how to bow hunt and, well, I feel like a better word, how to deer hunt just in general, I guess, um, I also was finding girls, of course, um, and then um, I got led astray a little bit. Uh, I kind of started going in some darker directions. I kind of started getting myself in some trouble that I, didn't, I shouldn't have been in, um, you know, kind of guilty by association kind of thing. Um, and for my teenage years, um, I got into abusing alcohol extremely bad um, and, and absolutely not scared to admit that because I, I know what I was doing was wrong. And it was one party after another, and, and I was starting to lose sight of what really mattered and, and kind of got a little AWOL on some things. Um, and thankfully, um, as, as I started coming out of that, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, the man upstairs had a plan for me uh, to have gotten me through those five or six years of troubled times that I was in. Because um, when I come out of that, when I, got to, when I graduated high school, still kind of, Still kind of wayward, a little sideways. Uh, then I made it towards, to see, I graduated when I was 18, so 19, 20-ish. Um, I'd met some other people uh, that kind of started pulling me back in the right direction. And, and, and for some reason, um, I had this epiphany um, that, that the outdoors is what saved me and got me out of those situations or got me out of that situation that four or five year period of time. It got me out of that. Uh, when I was reintroduced to some new people when I was 20-ish or so that, you know, kind of really got me into hunting hard for, for whitetail at the time. And I thought, man, I said, the only thing that saved me was these guys introducing me to the outdoors again. And it pulled me out of that well uh, of no return that I was in. Um, and I thought, man, I've got to do something. i got to do something. So I 
I, I, I kid you not, I, I actually was I was dating a gal that that, um, that well, she was one of the reasons I'd got out. Of course, she talks about I was into girls, but this this gal was a was an outdoorsman, and, and her family was big outdoorsman, and, and um, so we started I started going to church uh, more often, um, and so her pastor of her church was a big hunter, and and I'd been going there for six or eight months with her, and and, and I, I felt that I could talk to this pastor of this church. Um, openly, and I went up to him one day, and I said, his name was Mr. Larry Swain. I said, Mr. Larry, I said, I, I got something I want to tell you, and I said, I think it's a bit absurd. I said, but I keep, I keep having this come through my mind, and I don't know how to get it out of there, um, but I need to tell you. He said, man, you know, hey, nothing's crazy. You tell me whatever you want to tell me. I'm here for you. I said, okay, sir. I said, I feel uh, that the outdoors saved me from being in a lot of trouble. I said, I think at the end of the day, the reason I'm out of that is because the man upstairs has a vision for me, and I'm supposed to be a professional outdoorsman. And I said, I don't think that's a job. I don't think that's I don't think that is anything that I could ever think of. But I think I'm supposed to talk to people and teach people about the outdoors and what a great place it is to be, um, because I, you know it's it saved me. And he's like, Tony, if that's if that's what you're supposed to do, that's what you're supposed to do. He said, Do you think I, uh, when I was 13 years old, do you think I was going to be a did you, do you think that I thought I was going to be a preacher of a church at this time? He said, I didn't have any idea I was going to be a preacher for my possession, or my, um, uh, not possession, um, my career, I guess. Uh, profession, that's what I was looking for, my profession. Um, he said, but it just hit me one day that that's what I was supposed to do, and I changed my life, and now I'm a full-time pastor of a church. He said, so what you're thinking and what, what you have in your head is not crazy. If you want to be that, the only person that's in the way of you being that is you. So go after it. So where this name Traveling Hunter come to pass is, is I was reading North American Whitetail and Deer and Deer Hunting religiously. I would read that sucker from cover to cover, front to back, upside down, any way I could read it to get more information about the outdoors and how to manipulate deer in their uh, native habitat to become better a deer hunter. And I wanted to write articles about it and teach people and let people, in essence, live vicariously through me. And the only way that I knew to do that was to shoot a big deer and then write a story about it was the only way I thought at that time that I could get people to read my articles. Um, so I, I took a job where I worked six months a year. I worked six months through the summer and then six months through hunting season. I didn't work a lick. So I would get in my truck. I, I drove a an old Toyota pickup truck with a camper on it, and I would go from state to state to state to state to state for six months at a time and loop back home again after that six months. So I would hit Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, any place I could get a tag uh, over the counter without a hard draw. And then I would come home and I would compile all the deer that I had shot and write stories about each and every one of them. Um, and then started writing articles about that in different publications around here in Tennessee. Uh, specifically, one was Tennessee Outdoor News. Um, so uh, two or three years of that, and then that's where the name Traveling Hunter started to sink in, and all my buddies were starting to call me that because I see all my buddies, you know, 21, 22, 23 years old, through summertime, but come wintertime, I disappear for six months. I fall in a hole and disappear. But at the end of the day, I was in a tree stand in the state somewhere every day, their entire hunting season. So that's kind of, I guess, long-winded version of where the name Traveling Hunter come to pass was that's what I was doing for six months. Well, it certainly yeah. sounds like, sorry, that it certainly Go sounds ahead. like God has blessed what you've done with, with your life and, and, you know, have had a lot of success with it. Um, that's pretty cool. I have been, uh, I've been absolutely very fortunate. The man upstairs um, got me through those issues, and I could have, I could have easily instead of swinging left at the curve, I could have swung right and, and been in jail, uh, been in, been an alcoholic, uh, could be dead because there's been many nights that I would have, I got up in the morning from a, a nightly, uh, thirsty, uh, evening, I guess, if you will, uh, not to be too graphic, but get up in, in, in the morning and, and my mirrors would be tore off my truck or grass would be hanging out underneath the bumper of my truck and I have no idea how that happened. I have no recollection I had come home so intoxicated. Um, but, but no doubt the man upstairs saw uh, something in me and, and got me to the point uh, to I could, and, well, got me 
hooked up with the right people, if you will, um, put me in the right places to meet the right people, and, and they uh, pulled me out of it. And then, of course, Mr. Larry Swain, the, uh, the pastor there that I talked to so many years ago, I uh, said, man, you know, if that's what you think you're supposed to do, go do it. And, and, and I did. Um, you know, so yeah, a lot of things fell into place, and, and no doubt there was, there was somebody putting those uh, pieces of puzzle in place for me. I've kind of thought about this in my own personal life and we're kind of going in a, a dip, definitely in a different direction that I kind of thought about before this call, but, um, just growing up and watching, you know, God work in my life and in different people's lives, you can kind of tell that sometimes there are certain people that have desires that are like overwhelming and they're just, they're more extreme than, than other people do. And those desires that are in their heart, I don't think it's by accident. I think sometimes that God puts us with people or in situations where he knows we'll attach to something that will bring glory to him and will also be a way of escape from temptation. Like it talks about in Corinthians, you know, he'll offer a way of, of escape. And it kind of sounds like that for you. And I think it's it's been sort of like that for me in my own personal life. And I've kind of had to juggle actually hunting and and God and church and, and make sure that, you know, I didn't make hunting an idol. However, you know, it's also been a really good outlet for me going through my young adult life that the times I was staying out of trouble, you know, a lot of times I was in a tree stand or doing something, you know, different occupying my time. But I think that's pretty interesting. Oh, I, I appreciate guarantee you sharing. You, man. And, that's, you know. and, and that's, you know, that's what happened, man. I, um, uh, I started getting a tree stand and instead of getting into the bars on Friday night, I would, I would work, as hard as I could on Friday nights and while my buddies were out partying, I'd work as hard as I could because I knew come September 28th, opening, opening the Tennessee deer season, what I was going to be doing. Um, I, I remember uh, one gal uh, that I was working for at a time there, um, she said, Tony, it's Friday night at 9 o'clock. Why in the world are you still working? Man, you're 21 years old. You should be out of the partying tonight. I said, deer season starts here in a couple of weeks, and i got to make every dollar I can make because come deer season, I'm out. Clock me out. I'm deer hunting. I ain't got time to be partying right now. Um, so, so yes, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, at the end of the day, every day that we put one foot in front of another, the man upstairs already knows what that day is going to entail before we pass it. Um, so there's, there's definitely a path out there for us. And, and, um, uh, thankfully, um, I was able to see that path and, and, and jump on it and, and cruise with it. Most definitely when you were looking at areas to hunt, um, out of state, so you was trying to pick a, say that some public land area, let's just say Illinois, for instance, what would you look for? What factors would you consider? Would you look at like hunter numbers, land mass, or would you uh, call biologists? How would you really come to, to the conclusion? This is the particular WMA that I want to hunt or, you know, going through different places that you would discard and not want to go to. Well, I tell you, you know, it, it, that's kind of what I did um, when I was at that turning point in my life where I wanted to hunt all winter long and, and go out and collect these hunting articles while I was gone. Um, and coming from Tennessee, you know, I, like I said, I, I was reading North American whitetail and deer deer hunting religiously. Uh, and one thing that, that well, of course, uh, deer, uh, um, North American whitetail, it had articles about big bucks that were killed, and I, I always saw Iowa and Illinois popping up, popping up every edition, every month, more stories, more stories. I'm like, wait a minute, this year's not a coincidence. Um, I, I'm not seeing Tennessee pop up in North American whitetail every month, but I am seeing Illinois and Iowa. This year's making a little sense to me. Um, so I started digging into that a little bit uh, just because I was reading it and seeing it in print. So if it was happening and it was getting in print, um, it, it meant, um, you know, there was a better chance of me being successful in these states where these other guys were shooting these you know, 200 inch whitetail, which I had never heard about. Um, but one thing that I, I considered is, is in these articles about uh, finding new ground and hunting new property, they, they kept talking about something that I could never figure. Um, they talked about hunting bottlenecks, funnels, draws, pinch points, and hunting here in Tennessee. I was hunting big blocks of timber, and, and I, I remember walking a, a certain patch of timber there one day and going, what in the heck? are these guys talking about? There's no pinch points, bottlenecks, funnels, draws in this property. What are they talking about? Hmm. And then I got to doing a little bit more research and found out 
that in most cases they're in the Midwest uh, where these guys were shooting these big deer. So um, I, I was fortunate enough that, that my dad had a good coon hunting buddy up in southern Illinois, uh, and he said, hey, man, if you ever want to you know, hunt out of state, which at that time, man, it was right there on the cusp of starting to be traveling hunter. Um, so I, I took this gentleman's um, uh, opportunity to come on up to hunt southern Illinois, and I, I'd got an archery tag over the counters at that time, like 125 bucks or something. And, and I went up there, and he put me on this farm, and the light bulb went off like a Roman candle. I'm like, oh, my gosh, here is the bottleneck that <laughs> North American Whitetail has been telling me about. So it didn't take but one trip to the Midwest to realize how much, and I'm going to say this loosely, how much easier it is to shoot a bigger deer because up there they have bottlenecks, funnels, pinch points, draws, all this kind of stuff that will naturally dictate a deer's movements. Here in Tennessee, you grow on a 300-acre farm and 200 acres of timber. It's going to be tough to pinch one down. But I can tell you right now, I can take you to Shawnee National Forest in southern Illinois, which is 180,000 acres of public ground, and within minutes we'll have you on deer sign, and you will understand what I'm talking about with the pinch points and things like that that makes life so much easier and like we talked earlier in the conversation it's only two and a half hours from my doorstep to southern illinois <laughs> you know what tony when i was a kid i used to read all the same magazines and at one point i thought man i just must be really slow because i'm not getting this i don't understand with the, the bottlenecks the pinch points i was like writing them down and i was writing out definitions and all this other stuff <laughs> and i was like and i just, wore a pair of shoes exist. man looking for them down here <laughs> <laughs> it's like where are these things yeah, you know, well, I, said, I said man I'm, I'm like you i'm like man i must be slower in the lashes on a january morning because i can't find a pinch point nowhere man this is ridiculous they're uh, but when they're, i got at, when i go when i traveled a little bit I, I i quickly realized what they were talking about and then and then it, you know like i said the roman candle went off um and i i quickly knew then that that i would still always live in tennessee um, but I would absolutely, for those six months that I had off to travel, spend most of it not in Tennessee. As far as when, uh, you know, talking about hunting Southern Illinois, especially that's pretty hilly terrain, right? Uh, it can be, uh, this depends on where, uh, whereabouts you are in Southern Illinois. If you're on the, uh, on the Ohio river side, the Eastern side, uh, some of that Shawnee stuff over there, you have to have repel gear to get in and out of it. It's, it's really nasty. Uh, but if you swing uh, to the western side of the Illinois southern tip, uh, it's a lot flatter and it's it's not too bad. Uh, but it does have some roll to it, and and really it reminds me of what I grew up in here in in Tennessee. You know, just kind of rolly terrain, um, just a lot more crop up there and a lot less timber. If you were looking at like a topo map uh, of say of that particular area, what type of uh, terrain features would you pick out first i mean like saddles benches what would you look for first when you're going into an area blind well what i always tend to look for and, and um uh, they always say a way to man's heart is food um uh, that's what i'd look for i'd look for public ground not per se a, a topography map but public ground that that butted up to private agricultural ground um you know and uh, Corn and soybeans is, is what they grow up there uh, in abundance. And anytime you got a food source, you're going to have the volume of deer. So I always look for some place that butted up to the grocery store. When you're looking at those particular areas, are you hunting the edge of that, or are you just are you looking legitimately for that funnel or that pinch point to hunt right off of that? Well, you know, one thing you you kind of do run into, uh, and of course. Uh, Shawnee is 180,000 acres, so it's a lot of diverse terrain. Uh, but one thing that I always look for, because uh, when you get into Shawnee, some of it is really big timber and very hard to, to navigate and, and find those pinch points. Uh, but typically what I found was that around the private ground, there was always fences, you know, uh, and these fences blocked off the Shawnee to the grocery store, to the, to the corn or the soybeans. Uh, and then I would try to find what in essence was a sort of uh, a pinch point or a funnel was find where a tree had fell over a fence, you know, or, or the fence was down or it was missing two strands or whatever. Um, and let that be my pinch point um, was, was the fence crossing going into the neighbor's uh, ag fields. It's kind of what I always look for. 
Now, now that has changed over time because as, as time progressed, I stayed hunting that Shawnee for six or eight years, and then I moved further north, and it got way on up in the Midwest, uh, uh, about two hours north of St. Louis, up to Pike, Adam, and Brown County, which is world-renowned white hunting. And when you get up there, the, the pinch points and bottlenecks are even more visible and more blatantly out in the open where you go, oh, yeah, I'm going to hunt right there. You know, especially with today's technology, you know, you've got Google Earth and Onyx Maps and all these ways that we can see. You know, I can, I can, send, I can drop a pin on a place right now and send it to you through my cell phone, and you open this page up, and you go, oh, gosh, I'm going to hunt right there. It's that obvious. Um, so Shawnee is a little more difficult to find those pinch points. Uh, that's why I use pinch crossings and, and food sources to, to narrow down where the deer were at until I started moving further north and really found uh, pinch points and bottlenecks and draws and things like that. We were actually talking to another gentleman named, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with John Eberhart, but uh, we were talking to him. We were talking to him about public land hunting and he, he does a lot of that. And he kind of does like what you do. He's from Michigan. He'll travel around different States hunting. And he was saying one of the things that he does is um, focuses in on smaller public ground areas that have a lot of agriculture and a lot less hardwoods. And it kind of seems like you're, you probably have the same idea. Am I right there? Absolutely. You know, like you try to, like I said, you know, you're at 180,000 acres and that is absolutely overwhelming uh, to, to try to, to dissect down. But if you, if you start, uh, okay, so, so when you get a Big Mac, do you eat the whole Big Mac in one bite or do you take small bites and kind of will it off? Of course, you take a bite at a time, and that's the same way you do Shawnee, man. You find something or, or any public ground, you know, in general. Uh, you find it, and you, you say, oh, okay, man, there's, there's 500 acres of public ground here, but there's food over here, so, you, you know, you try to narrow it down and, and whittle off the stuff that don't mean as much to you and go to the places that are going to be more hot, and, and, and just like that gentleman says, it's, it's going to be food, especially late season. Um, uh, you know, late season up in the Midwest is all muzzled or hunting. There's there's no no big gun, no centerfire rifles in the Midwest, and typically their temperatures are going to be a lot colder uh, than than they will be here. So uh, when it's post rut, which is typically when a when a gun season is going to come in, they they run down from the rut. They're wore out. They're beat up. Temperatures coming in. The cold is coming in on them. They got to find some place to eat and recharge. Uh, and that's kind of how I started. Uh, digging some of these places out was just looking for food and where public butted up to private. So uh, I, in essence, was hunting the private ground on the public side, if that makes sense to you. I was hunting where the deer wanted to be, so I was trying to get in between where they bedded in this big block of timber and get in between them to where they wanted to go feed on the private side over there. Interesting. So as as you traveled, were would you chase around the rut or weather patterns, or how did you choose where to go when when you were hunting multiple states in a year? Okay, so if so, the the, the three letter word that everybody reads about, writes about, talks about is the rut. Man, I can't wait to the rut. Man, that second week in November, that's going to be the rut. Well, for a person that wants to shoot something in a very short period of time, which most of us in general have, if we work for a company of some sort, we'll have a week or two week vacation. So that means we're going to get one week to go hunt. And everybody tries to do it around the rut because deer are on their feet, they're moving, they're running crazy. But at the end of the day, in my opinion, and there'll be people that will contradict this, but in my opinion, the rut is the worst time of the year to hunt. And here's why. Okay, so yes, so, so we're running trail camera pictures right now, okay? Our trail cameras, and we're looking at all these all these bucks we're getting, all these trail camera photos. Man, this big five by five, this big ten point, he's showing up every day. He's showing up every day. He's paddleable. He's showing up every day. Come November, he's gone. So we're sitting in a tree in the rut, just hoping that he shows up. He could be four counties away. Now, granted, the one that's four counties away might run past you, which is awesome. I'd rather be lucky than good any day. But if I'm going to go spend time in the timber and only have a short amount of time to do it, I'm going to do it where I'm most effective, and that's where deer are on a paddleable stage, and the rut ain't paddleable at all. So I would typically 
tried to go where I didn't have to deal with the rut. Okay, so so this is the reason that the muzzleloaders has consumed me. The middle of this country, the Midwest, there's no center fire rock with Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa. Um, when you get over into uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, they do have some big gun stuff over there, but they also have amazing muzzleloader seasons. So, so if you draw a tag in Kansas for a muzzleloader, early season, that early season, okay, so Tennessee, I'm in Tennessee here. Some guys still haven't got their bows out to shoot them yet, okay, because we've got hot temperatures. Bow season opened last week, but it's still super hot. Nobody's bow hunting. But I can tell you right now, I know 25 guys that shot bucks over 160 inches in Kansas two and a half weeks ago with a muzzleloader. So these guys are hunting early season when the bucks are still coming to the food source every day. They're still buddies. There's a bachelor group of 10 different bucks coming to the same field every day. That's the kind of hunting I want to do. I know I can count on that. They're coming to the same place every day. Um, Kentucky has an awesome early season. It is pre-rut. It's when calling works, rattling works. It's not rut yet, but it's close. It's like October 16th. So the Bluegrass State, I go to Kansas. I go to Kentucky for the, for the two days of muzzle season they have there. Um, Illinois has a uh, muzzle season there that is uh, typically the third week of November. Uh, the deer are out of lockdown. Of course, now during the rut, there's one thing that screws everything up, and that's the lockdown. That's when they get with a hot doe. They pin her to the ground. They won't let her move. They can stay bedded for three days. You could be sitting in a tree stand for three days and never see an animal. After that happens, Illinois gun season comes in. Three, three or two weeks of the rut, they're going back to food source. I got a muzzle in my hand. After that, Iowa. After that, late season, uh, Kansas has got a great late season. Oklahoma uh, has a, I skipped Oklahoma, but Oklahoma has a really good early season muzzle or two uh, the last week of October. Again, right before the rut, before any kind of lockdown or any kind of craziness happens that you can't control. Um, Nebraska has an amazing late season. Uh, it gets up into the cold weather. That's a muzzleloader only season. They're coming to the food source again. They're super palatable. Um, so I, I try to do it. You know, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna spend the money to go to these states, you got uh, time away from home, time away from work, uh, travel costs, hunting license, guns, all tree stands, all the stuff that that goes into this. I want to do it where I'm most effective. And in most cases, it's when I have a muzzleloader in my hand because I'm hunting a palatable time of, of year in a deer's life. That's really interesting. So, uh, if if somebody just wants to kill a big mature buck, um, and and they don't mind doing doing it with their muzzleloader or bow or however, um, based on what you're saying, would you still recommend Iowa as being the most likely place to be able to do that? Or it sounds like Kansas could be a real player in that. Kansas is a really big player. Uh, like I said, Kansas offers an opportunity that no other state in this country offers, and that's to be in the timber or in, in the outdoors. Kansas ain't got a lot of timber, so maybe that's a little strong word, but in the outdoors, um, uh, when bucks are still in a bachelor group mode and you have a gun in your hand and the muzzle as I shoot today, I can shoot 300 yards very effectively. Okay, so, so and I don't go grocery shopping ever. My, my wife does it all. But I, I can picture what it's like in a grocery store. So if you go up to the meat counter, there's 50 steaks in the, on the meat counter. And you go, mm, I'm going to take that one right there. And you pick it up, put it in your basket, and you go check out, and you go home. That's the same way Kansas is if you have a muzzle in your hand. You go, to a stand, you go to a standing bean field, there's 15 bucks in the field. You go, mm, yeah, I want that one. Boom. Put the tag on and go home. That's kind of how I like. <laughs> you're you're saying some of the, the same things my cousin has said. Now he's hunted out there, I think two or three times in Kansas during muzzleloader season, and he said he hunts around some small town. And people will always ask him like, "What are you doing here?" Because basically no one's muzzleloader hunting during that time. And he's mm-hmm. he's talking about how great the hunting is. So that that's pretty interesting. You're saying the same thing. Now, is it hard to find good public ground in Kansas or is it better for someone that's wanting to do this to go find an outfitter or pay a trespassing fee? 
Well, you know, there is a lot of really good public ground in Kansas. I mean, I, I have a, a pile of great friends over the years that have shot absolute barn burners uh, in pub, or on public land in Kansas. Uh, so it is absolutely possible if you do your homework. Um, you know, but, but Kansas is, is, is a little different. You still can go get permission. Uh, I know that's weird to say if you get, oh, you're going to give me permission to go hunt your place? Yeah. Uh, some places in Kansas, you still can do that. Um, you know, so, so typically how I would do it, uh, I would go out there uh, after I drew the tag uh, in an area that I'd kind of been looking at uh, and not per se suit and tie dress up, but at least dress up like I had some sense uh, and walk up to somebody's door and just knock on the door and go, hey, how you doing? My name's Tony Smotherman. Good to meet you. I uh, just wonder if you'd allow any deer hunt on your place, ma'am. And 80% of the time, they said yes. And that definitely doesn't sound in like, area like it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, man. No, that's what I'm saying. It's a, it's, it's a little bit of a different world. People still great folks out there, which, of course, there's great folks all over the country, but um, they're, they're just a different uh, animal or different type person out there where they still let you go hunting. But there's also big tracts of ground. Uh, hunting is a mainstay out there. Uh, you can go out there uh, late season when everybody, when the gun season comes in, in the whole town shuts down everybody's deer hunting so it's it's kind of a way of life so so they get what you're asking to do they understand uh that you you know that you're a deer hunter and you like to go deer hunting because they probably do it themselves too or have do you use any mapping applications or technology for that as far as keeping track of property lines and that kind of stuff you know i it's fun you say that about 20 minutes before we got on this uh, podcast tonight i just downloaded onyx maps (laughs) <laughs> uh, I, so I haven't up until right now, um, and, and, and I'm not, now I leave for I leave for Wyoming here in two days, uh, and I will use it out there. Um, so I haven't in the past, but I am going forward. Yeah, well, and that's one of the ones I was thinking of, and uh, I, I and I was thinking of Kansas specifically because I've seen some videos where uh, even the public there's there's a good amount of public, but it's like a checkerboard out there. You'll yeah, we can hunt here, but the property line's here, and then, but if the deer's running that way. If we drive all the way around half a mile, we can catch them on the other side, kind of deal. Yeah, and and you're exactly right. There's a lot of checkerboarded stuff. You know, there's a lot of state ground and school ground. For some reason, uh, some of those areas out there have school property, even though there's no school by it. They call it school ground. I'm still confused to that one. Um, so you do have to know uh, with a mapping service like what we're talking about here for the sheer fact that everything looks the same and it's hard to tell the difference because there is no difference just standing on the ground so it's where those new mapping services come into play and will save your tail from trespassing (laughs) um i I want to take it a little bit different direction hopefully um you can help us out here um let's say somebody further south you're you know in Tennessee there, you might be a couple hours from, from Iowa, but if you're down in, say, Georgia or Florida, um, you know, it's, it's quite a haul to get up there. But I was kind of thinking of a scenario. Let's say you're in Georgia, and um, your hunting season there ends in uh, middle of January, uh, but you'd like to maybe get some more hunts in. Mm-hmm. And Alabama's not too far away. Mississippi's not too far away. And I know they've got late ruts there, so... Um, You know, if you want to try chasing the rut because you don't have specific deer you're going to be going after, um, how would you how would you go about it if if you're one of those people and and just figuring out where to hunt, um, you know, kind of like a last minute deal where you're just going to make a trip out there? You know, I I think I think it um, at the stage of technology that we're in right now in our in our lives and in this world, the social media avenues put you in front of so many like-minded individuals now. So like on my Instagram, um, the guys that I follow and the gals that I follow, most of them are hunters. Um, So I I think that um, the ability for us to connect with so many like-minded individuals across this country through social media is is if I had to do that today, that's where I'd lean. I I would lean towards finding somebody that I knew in that area, um, you know, and, you know, if you call me and go, hey, Tony, man, man, I sure want to go hunt middle Tennessee, man, but I, I don't got no connection. I will do everything in my power to try to help you and find you a place because I know what this feeling is like. So I think if I had to go down there, I would lean on social media to, to find people that I 
you know, or, or you know, I guess find people I didn't know um, and, and just kind of start picking different people uh, for information that lived in those regions that I could get to quickly, you know, such as, uh, such as yourself living down south down there and wanting to cut over to Alabama or cut over to Mississippi. Um, I, I think, um, I think if, if that's where I was at today, that's what I'd do. I'd find people that lived over there uh, and pick them for information. Uh, because, you know, the, the way that I found a lot of these great hunting spots across the country is through magazines, but um, magazines don't really talk about uh, L.A. or, you know, lower Alabama or, or Mississippi, you know. So it, that'd be a little tough. But I, I think, you know, the Internet – uh, and social media would, would be my way to gather information. No, I think that's some good advice. Um, so maybe once you pick a property, um, I, I know in the Midwest you, you hunt a lot of those funnels and pinch points and that kind of stuff, but I also know you've got a lot of experience hunting the south and some other areas. So maybe in those big timber areas where maybe there aren't the ag fields, um, how would you attack a, a property like that as far as just kind of going in blind? I know... I'm asking a difficult question, um, so I'm not expecting a, you know, oh, this is this is the secret answer, but it's also something that a lot of us struggle with as well. You know, I think maybe, um, I think with that mapping service that we was kind of talking about there, the OnX maps, you know, it, it gives you a, a great Google Earth view and also tells you landowners. Um, I think if I had to go in blind, I would do a little bit of search uh, on the internet of where maybe some of the better deer come from in those states uh, and then kind of pinch it down. And let's say we found a, a 200 acre farm that somebody allowed us to trespass on and let us hunt on. Um, now, number one, I wouldn't enter that property unless I had uh, the wind in my face because uh, the last thing you want to do is blow deer off the property to the neighbors. Um, and when that wind was right, uh, I would go in and walk the perimeters. Um, I know most of the farms and places that I've ever been on um, in the south always had some kind of fences on the perimeter, which is going to be your bottleneck or your pinch point, no different than that Shawnee stuff he was talking about earlier. So I'd find crossings there uh, and just start dissecting it down. And, you know, like I said, no, you don't eat a Big Mac in, in, in one bite. You, you eat it in little bitty bites. And, and I would start finding where they've come and, come in and went uh, from the property. Um, and then start backing it up and, and find a place where I'd like to be for a good finish point. Yeah, that's some good advice. I, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. I imagine you probably could do the same thing with water crossings or, you know, any of the, you know, anything that I guess would serve as a pinch point. Like you're saying, you might not be able to see it on the map, but maybe just start by walking the perimeters and, and seeing what's there. That's right. You know, that those, those bottlenecks and draws, man, those funnels, man, they're, they're tough to find uh, when you get down here in the south, and, and um, you know you got to almost come up with uh, or make a pinch point, sort of like you're talking about a creek crossing or something that's going to make them use a certain path more frequently. And that's a uh, three stand bar, three stand three strand barbed wire fence that's missing the top two strands. Um, even here in Tennessee on the farms I have, I have uh, uh, one small little 40 acre piece of timber, and it's all timber. There's, I mean, it's 100% timber, but I can take you to every fence crossing and it's war slap out. Um, so uh, that's what I do. I would walk the perimeter fences if they had that, and, that, and, and if they didn't, if they didn't have that, then I start backing up and looking for other kind of, uh, you know, creek crossings or, uh, you know, um, timber that led up next to a creek bank and they couldn't cross the creek bank and uh, it made them hug the creek bank instead of going down the bank. Or you know, there's there's a bunch of ways you can. Once your mind understands uh, deer movement and the terrain dictates their movement, uh, if there's deer in the area, we can find them pretty quick just by going in and be kind of open-minded and uh, a little bit of understanding of how deer travel. And they're just like me and you. They're going to take the, la the, the path of least resistance, um, and, and that's what you look for when you go in and find ground. Uh, tomorrow I will be in Southern Illinois. I'm leaving my home here in the morning at 5 o'clock, and I'm going to go walk a new farm that I've never seen. Um, and it's mostly timber, but I can, I bet you my shorts right now that within minutes, I'll know where to put a tree stand. Yeah. So are you going to walk if, if I, I imagine you probably looked at aerials and stuff. Are you going to walk fence lines first then? Uh, I have looked at the aerials. Yes. Uh, and because it is so much timber, um, I guarantee you there's fences on that property and that's where I'm going. I walked it. 
number one, I'll walk the perimeters just so I don't walk through the middle of the farm and blow everything out to the neighbors. Um, so, you know, it kind of comes down to tread lightly, uh, go in with the wind in your face. Don't punch through the middle to push everything out. Yeah. To stay as far on the outside perimeter as you can. To, you know, the last thing you want to do is run them over to, to Johnny's place. Um, keep them, keep them in the middle. And, and, you know, when you, even when you lay out, uh, farms to hunt, you got food plots on and things like that. Um, I always put it in the middle so that you can kind of come in from the sides and not push everything out. And that's the way I'll approach this farm in the morning. First thing I'll hit the perimeters and, and then go from there. Do you have a rule of thumb as far as how far away from maybe deer bedding you would be willing to walk up wind? Obviously if the further is the better, but if, you know, maybe there's a field in between or something that, you know, is there somewhere you're comfortable walking up wind of where you think deer might be? You know, I tell you, if I think there's deer in a certain area, if you look at it on a, on a map or, or when you get on the farm, you go, oh, man, that, that, that stuff's thick right there, man. I stay away from it as far as I can. You know, the last thing you want to do is get in there and, and mess up their routine because even if, it, even if the deer's not there when you go there, man, if you come into my house and you're wearing some cologne, I know you've been there even though you're not there. It's because I know it. I know my home. I know what it smells like. I know what everything looks like. And the deer lives in that bedding area every day of his life. And if you go in there and do something or you get a little too close or put a little too much pressure, they're going to know. So if I know there's a bedding area, I try to steer away from it like it's got leprosy. I do not want to be anywhere close to it. Well, you're getting in there. Do you practice any type of scent control while you're scouting these farms and do you practice scent control while you're hunting you know oh, absolutely you know there's there's so many scents out there on the market today and uh back years ago cover scent was the biggest thing man you put some fresh earth or some cedar or pine or all whatever else uh white acre and on you or something like that uh, but i would prefer for them not to know i was there at all so um, you know, I wash everything in, in a scent, uh, a scent free detergent, scent away kind of product. Um, I want to be as, uh, non-intrusive as possible. So I don't wear anything that has touched any scent. Um, my clothes, even when I go scout these farms, uh, or hang trail cameras, my clothes is in scent free totes in the back of my truck. Um, you know, so tomorrow I'm going to drive roughly three hours to get to this farm. Uh, I'm going to ride in a truck that I can guarantee you I've eaten McDonald's in one time or another. That sucker's going to smell like a French fry, I promise you. <laughs> so the last thing I want to do is wear clothing to this location that I'm going to walk this farm in. So my clothing will be in the back. Uh, when I get on location, I will strip down as close to naked as I can get, um, spray down with, with a scent spray, wash my hands in that scent spray out of the truck, put on those scent-free clothes in the back, and then I will we'll take out. Uh, if I'm hanging trail cameras, I'll go and hang a trail camera. Um, when I put that trail camera on the tree, of course, you know, we got oil on our hands and our body, you know, has oil on and all. Like you touch your face and there's always oil on your face. Then you go touch the camera and then you walk out and your camera smells like body oil or your whatever scent you're putting off. You know, so I'll hang this camera up and then I'll spray it down with a scent spray and I'll spray every weed, every bush, blowing it down as I'm walking backwards out of that, that camera set. So, yes, yeah, scouting. Just looking at new property, not necessarily scouting. I never go in one unless I am as ghost-like as I possibly can be. I know it sounds a little bit ridiculous, but you know when you, you know everybody wants to shoot a big deer, and 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 maybe may, maybe everybody wants to, but everybody don't, and you know not going to put in the effort to do it, which is absolutely fine. But you know when you get a big deer that's four and a half or five and a half years old, he's not going to take a whole lot of pressure, and and us being a little bit sloppy, so. So, yes, man, when I go in, I absolutely am as scent-free as possible. Do you use any ozone products at all? Man, you know, that is a big, hot topic, the, the ozon, ozonic-style products. Um, as a scent crusher, I believe, I see a lot of people talking yeah, there's about. there's going to be more and more options. You know, there's, you know, they don't have a patent on ozone technology, just on, you know, certain uses of it. So, obviously, there's going to be more and more competition in it. Yeah, absolutely, and and I just can't see it. I can't see it. I can't smell it. And my, I'm a mechanical-minded person, and and I, I like to see and feel and 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 see how things work. And you know, I I can tell you an ozone machine that has a fan running in it, making a little bit of humming noise. 
but it ain't blowing out nothing. And I could tell you it's blowing out ozone. And I, I wouldn't, you wouldn't know the difference, or nor would I. Um, so I, it might be the greatest thing in the world, uh, but man, I, I, I can't. I, I, I hadn't put a whole lot of interest in it yet. I, I've not been proven. Plus, I've done a little bit of research on ozone, and if you get too much ozone, it will kill you. It's by what I read. Of course, anything on the internet is true. Is yeah. that's what I've been told. <laughs> um, but it, it, it just makes me a little bit leery, and I, and I don't and I don't understand it. Uh, therefore, I'm not real comfortable in using it. You know, and I, I've been shooting deer all over the country and elk and muleys and antelopes and bear and everything else just by being as ghost-like as I possibly can, and, and that, that works pretty good for me at this point. I, man, I'll be honest. I'm almost surprised to hear you say it just because I know you're – I mean, you make your living in the industry. I almost would feel like you'll have to, like, say something. You know, maybe you don't know. I don't know. I was almost surprised to hear you say that there's something – Somebody willing to go on a limb and say they don't believe in something because what if they come, you know, what if they come knocking on your door next week with a sponsorship or, you know, which well, I'm sure I'm you can change I don't your believe mind. In that. But, I just, yeah, I just hadn't. I, I don't know enough about it. Yeah. Um, and and I and I'm not educated enough to say yes, it works or no, it don't work. I just I just can't see it working, and and it, I'm a little skeptical. Um, I, I guess maybe if I went out and bought one of those machines and 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 I had deer coming in from from downwind and and they walked right up under me and I was eating a, a roast beef sandwich and they didn't smell me then I go you know what <laughs> this stuff works yeah you know but I, I just hadn't been in that situation I think it's fair to say you could change your mind it was just interest it was almost I guess refreshing to hear that just to, that you had an opinion oh I, on absolutely <laughs> I absolutely yeah. could change my mind I just hadn't been around it I, you know it's yeah it's kind of one of those things they say you don't know what you don't know, and and I don't know ozonics. I, I've never used it or an ozone type uh, machine. I've never used it, so I just I just don't know about it. Yeah, that's interesting. But Century works for me pretty good. Now I, I can't go, you know, you can't go wrong with with you know going and uh, uh, going the extra mile and making sure that that everything is sent free. I mean. Even my safety harness has been hanging out in a in a tree out here for weeks on end, uh, just just airing out. You know, I just want to be as ghost like as possible. Uh, the fanny pack that I'm that I'm going to be using in Wyoming end of the week uh, has been it literally rained on probably 30 times. It smells like the outside. I just uh. I bought some used Sitka the other day off of a Facebook group. So, you know, I didn't want to pay full price for it. So I went on this Facebook group, found it for sale, bought it, got it in. It smells like that dude has sprayed Calvin Klein <laughs> cologne on it. So I think I'm about to do the th same thing. I think I'm about to strap it to one of these trees out here in my backyard and let the wind hit it for a few weeks. Oh, yeah, man. You need to let that thing air out, bud. <laughs> oh gosh, it's awful. It just it, as soon as I opened up that box, it's like dag gum, I'm gonna be picked off right away. That's all right, man. Wash it three or four times, it'll straighten up. Well, I got an oddball question for you. When you were going out, especially in your early um, early hunting career, to different states, were you staying the night? Were you camping out? Were you in a hotel? You know, were you in a tent? What were you doing for accommodations? I slept, I slept in the bed of my Toyota pickup truck every night. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I had a 1990 Toyota pickup truck. It was an extended cab, so I had the extended cab portion crammed full of gear, uh, clothes mostly, obviously. Uh, and then uh, I had a camper uh, on my truck, and I had, they call it like a bed rug, and it's uh, basically carpet that goes in your bed. It fills up the grooves in your bed, so so the floor of the bed of your pickup truck is smooth, uh, and, and I could sleep in it, so I slept in it every night. Uh, pretty much, unless I was going to visit a friend that I had made in an area that I was hunting, uh, and I would stay with him, but in most cases I stayed in my pickup truck. And I'd typically hunt right or stay asleep right there on the farm that I was hunting on, you know. So uh, hunt hunt till dark, come out, go to the truck, vaini weenies and, and and beanie weenies and some crackers uh, and a bottle of water. I'd go to bed right there on site, get right back up daylight, and go again. Yeah, that's hardcore. That is. Oh man, hey man, six months on the road, man. You know, you just had to, you just figured out how to make it, and you know, I, I just knew, man. I, just looking back on it, I wasn't blessed with 
uh, you know, a, a, a family that had a lot of money. Uh, I wasn't blessed with much of anything, but one thing I was blessed with, and that was drive and hunger. Um, and I knew, I knew what I wanted. I knew I wanted to be an outdoor rider. Uh, I knew uh, that I wanted to, to go out and, and hunt these areas and be able to harvest these deer and be able to come back and tell stories about it and hopefully touch some, somebody's life like my buddies touch my life, you know, and, and hopefully pull somebody out of a hole they was in and get them to the outdoors. Cause you know, at the end of the day, the outdoors is an amazing place to be. Um, there's so many things out there that the man upstairs created. And, um, you know, th- this day and time, uh, there's a lot of people that have no clue, uh, what the outdoors is like and, and what the man upstairs has done. Uh, um, and, um, I just knew what I wanted to, to do and what I wanted to be. And, I knew I wanted to be in the hunting industry. I knew I wanted to touch people's lives and try to get them steered in the same direction that I got steered into. And um, I was not going to let anything stand in my way of, of getting that if it meant sleeping in the back of my truck for six months on end and staying gone away from my family for six months and, um, you know, burning through every dollar I saved up through the summertime for travel expenses and food and, and, and hunting tags and things like that. I didn't care. I knew what I wanted and I wasn't going to let nothing stand in my way. You know, uh, there was an, an elderly gentleman uh, told me one time that, uh, you know, you can be anything you want to be as long as you want to be that bad enough. And I knew what I wanted to be. And so when I'd come in from these trips, I was, you know, I'd write all these hunting articles for Tennessee Outdoor News. Um, and over time, because I was reading all these hunting publications um, that were, you know, a national style publication, uh, I saw things that Tennessee Outdoor News could do better. Um, so, again, knowing what I wanted to do, I ended up buying Tennessee Outdoor News, and, and the owner um, uh, told me what he wanted for it. I wrote him a check, and he moved on, and I owned Tennessee Outdoor News for 10, 10 years. Uh, so, like, I just, you know, if you want to do something, you can do it, as long as you want to be bad enough. If you want to be a doctor, you can be a doctor. If you want to be a rocket scientist, you can be that. You just got to really, really, really want to do it and and. and and sacrifice a few things to get to that point. And, um, you know, my sacrifice was I didn't stay in a hotel or take a shower every day, uh, but but I did go hunting and I did come home and write articles, and I ended up on Tennessee Outdoor News, and I did host several television shows over the last 10 years and, and have made a good living in the hunting industry because I knew what I wanted to do, and, and I was blessed with, with a lot of drive and ambition. I saw in your bio that you were awarded the Tennessee Outdoor communicator of the year was that when you or, or when you own the tennessee outdoor news uh i think i still own tennessee outdoor news at the time yes i do believe that is correct that that's been a little while ago now so uh <laughs> so i was i was going down the road one day and and uh the tennessee wildlife federation one of the guys there uh one of the higher ups called me he goes hey man uh, what are you doing um uh whatever october whatever i said man that is the dumbest question any human could ever ask me. It's October. What do you think I'm doing, man? I'm deer hunting, dude. And he said, man, I need you to come to the War Memorial Building in downtown Nashville. I said, man, I ain't lost a thing in Nashville. I can promise you. He said, dude, you ain't got no choice. I said, uh, man, there's a lot of choices in this world. What do you mean I ain't got no choice? Somebody going to kidnap me or something? He said, dude, touch your hair, brush your teeth, and bring your tail to Nashville that night. You've got to come down here. Okay, okay, okay. So I go down there, and, and that's what it was that night. Was the uh, they was awarding me the Tennessee uh, commu- or Tennessee Outdoor Communicator of the Year. Um, and it was, you know, I, I guess at the end of the day, for all the articles that I'd written, and 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 then end up uh, making Tennessee Outdoor News one of the largest hunting and fishing magazines in the state for ten years. Uh, so again, one of those paths that was already laid out for me that I had no idea until I showed up down there. Really cool thing. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Yes. I, I got a question about your, you know, hunting on a budget and traveling around. I, I imagine you're pretty successful and shot some big deer. How did did you work out deals with taxidermists or for, you know, if if you shot a big buck, then they'd get their picture in the article, or how did you work that out if you're shooting two, three big bucks a year? Oh man, I shot more than two or three a year, man. It was <laughs> it was sometimes six or eight a year. Uh, you know, and of course at that time it. You know, they wasn't they wasn't one seventies, you know, they were one forty. I, I considered at that time when I was writing articles anything that was one forty or bigger, uh, it would grab somebody's eye enough to read that article. So uh so I always looked for that hundred and forty inch deer kind of thing. 
uh, or larger. Um, and man, you know, it's been a minute since I lived out of the back of my truck like that. I, I don't do that as much anymore now, but it's, it's, um, uh, you know, in, in most cases, um, I, I frequented the same places. The first year I would have to say was probably the toughest cause I didn't know anybody. Um, you know, and I, not real scared to talk to anybody so I, I would typically make friends in a location whether at a restaurant or something like that uh, typically make friends in an area that I was hunting in so as the years progressed it got a little easier so I could take advantage of well I use that a little bit loose but take advantage of the friends that I had made and and you know um, they'd allow me to park my four-wheeler or something at their house and 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 uh, they had a shed out back old tractor shed or something I could skin my deer out of and um, and then I iced my deer down. And occasionally, you know, of course, I traveled with a big cooler, and, and I did my own process and basically deboned everything, basically. And, and was, I mean, I was feeding my, I was feeding my dad. Well, I was feeding my whole family pretty much uh, most of the year when I got back with venison. But occasionally, uh, if I got a little too heavy, I'd have to pack up and, and come back in and, and lighten up a little bit and head back out again, you know. So I'd bring meat home if I had two or three deer down from a couple of different places and course keep them iced up and you know with big coolers and and a couple of dollars of ice here or there you can keep the meat fresh and we bring it back home and dump it all but again you know i could i could come out of a tree if, you know we're using southern illinois a lot here but if i if i was in illinois i could uh, if you know during the muzzleloader season up there you can get a buck and a doe so if you get two deer down i can come out of the tree uh at 10 o'clock come home dump it and be back you know um, um at least for the next morning's hunt so um uh, the first year, like I said, it was pretty rough. After that, it got a little easier. I'd made a lot of friends. Man, living the dream. Oh, man, yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm telling by, by December 15th, I look like Grizzly Adams coming down the road. You know, I, I wasn't so much living the dream at that time. I need to shower <laughs> in a bad way, I promise you. Well, Tony, we've, uh, it sounds like you got an early trip you got to make in the mornings, and I know it's kind of getting late here in real time anyway, so... I want to give you just a minute, if you want to, um, to tell people how they can find you on social media. And if you want to, tell them a little bit about what you got going on with Burger of Rifles. Well, you know, uh, as time has progressed, you know, and we went through all this magazine ownership and hosting different television shows and things like that, um, I worked for a muzzleloader company because through these Midwestern states, um, I, I really got into muzzleloading, and that kind of consumed me because they didn't allow center fires there. So I, I pretty much started uh, somewhat making a living hunting with a muzzleloader, uh, working for a night muzzleloader company out of Iowa. For I worked for those guys for 14 years, um, and then several years ago, they closed out and went out of business, and I, I hired on the next morning uh, with Connecticut Valley Arms, or everybody knows them as CVA, and I've been with CVA for eight years now. Um, so muzzleloading has, has been my world, um, but... Underneath or inside the, the CVA family, uh, we also own a company called Begara Rifles. Uh, it started out as Begara Barrels, and we started out as a barrel-making company just for our muzzleloaders. Uh, and then our barrel-making process has got so good that we started building them for other gun manufacturers, and we were that's called OEM. So we've built OEM barrels for other manufacturers. Um, and then as the last couple of years, uh, we've introduced, uh, we started out as, uh, we hire, we're hiring um, retired uh, military gunsmiths. So like uh, there's people in the military uh, over in Quantico that, that they're in the military building custom rifles for the military to protect our butts every day. So when they would retire, we started hiring them one at a time to come work for us at Begara Rifles. And uh, so it's, at this point in time, we actually have about 10 production rifles that we manufacture, uh, and then, of course, more coming uh, here at SHOT Show in 2018 uh, out in Vegas. Uh, but as of recent, uh, my job with CBA and Begara is, is a big fancy name called Influencer of Relations. Um, so my job is to uh, deal and handle with handle our pro staffers um, ambassadors for our brand across the country so um, I got guys and gals all over the country uh, that represent our brand uh, that um, I, you know I guess I, at the end of the day take care of and uh, they report to me if they need things and and um, 
uh, and I also handle all the CVA and Bagara television shows. So for years, I hosted television shows for several different companies just as a hired gun. I, I didn't own the shows, but I hosted them and, and did the hunts for them uh, and received the salary that way. Uh, and then uh, the last three years, I've hosted my own show, uh, Traveling Hunter, which was on the Sportsman's Channel for, for uh, like I said, three years. Uh, but now, uh, uh, I stopped that last year because, unfortunately, the gentleman we talked about earlier, my dad, they got me so dug into the well of hunting, or at least coon hunting anyways, and then pushed me as I continued to grow in the outdoor industry. Uh, he passed away at Christmas uh, this last year. Uh, so this last year, uh, 2016, was a very tough year. I had to make some uh, very tough decisions to do things that I didn't really want to do. And uh, number one, that was to, to – I'd been buying farms in Illinois. I had an outfitter operation in Illinois. I, I ended up selling all that. I ended up ceasing uh, filming outdoor television uh, for Traveling Hunter. I had to stay home and take care of my dad that uh, uh, eventually needed 24-hour, seven-day-a-week care. Uh, so I've hired on this new position at CVA in Megara um, and actually handle all the television shows there as well. So any TV show that you see that is sponsored by CVA, or Begara, uh, they deal directly with me uh, through the brand. Um, so I don't do TV now, but I still work with guys in TV. So the great thing is, is uh, over the last 20 years, I've been a writer, uh, obviously a hunter, a TV show host, and everything in between. So with what I do now, I get to help people that is in the same place I was. Uh, so it's kind of a unique situation. I've been where they're at. I know what they need out of us as a company, out of uh, us as a gun manufacturer. So I get to help these TV show hosts, these outdoor writers. Um, and, and, of course, I'm sure everybody's aware that, that long-range shooting is getting very popular uh, across the country now. Uh, and there's matches across the country called PRS, and which is Precision Rifle Series. Uh, so I handle the, the Precision Rifle Shooters also as a, as a daily job. And then I make appearances for CBA and Begara uh, all over the country. Uh, just this last weekend, uh, I shot with the Green Beret Foundation uh, in um, Apex, North Carolina. So I was over there shooting shoulder to shoulder with Green Berets that are still active special force individuals that protect our tails every day. Uh, so so it's really a cool position to be able to work for a company uh, that uh, that encompasses so much. You know, we're the number one muzzle to manufacture. Uh, we own power belt uh, bullets, smuggling bullets, which is the number one bullet manufacturer in the world. Uh, we also own Quake Slings, which is the number one sling manufacturer in the world. And now uh, Bagar Rifles, which will quickly be we're, we're the number one barrel manufacturer uh, and will be quickly uh, gaining steam as one of the top uh, production rifle manufacturers in the country as well. So, so I, I kind of, I guess all that said, I'm kind of the politician of the group, I think. <laughs> now that I think about it. I just, I just get to talk to people and help people out is what I do. Um, if they need guns, I help them. If they need something in the field, I help them, uh, that, you know, as long as it associates around our brand. So, uh, so yeah, it's really a cool thing. And, um, you know, if anybody, uh, has any interest in, in catching up with me or following me on social media, uh, it just goes down to traveling hunter. Uh, and that's country slang, no G. Um, my Instagram, my Facebook, everything is traveling hunter. Oh, great. I, I, I got one more question for you because I feel like I, I, after hearing you talk about that, we can't let you go. That almost would be a disservice to a lot of listeners. I think probably a lot of people listening have bows and probably a lot of people listening have rifles. Um, but maybe after listening to this, they might think, oh, man, it would be pretty neat to get into muzzle loading. Uh, what would you recommend somebody looking for as their their first uh, first muzzle loader, and maybe just a couple tips of what you need to know when you get one and when you first start using it? Man, I tell you what, we could do two more podcasts on that, my friend. <laughs> that is that is my that is my passion. Um, but the number one caliber muzzle loader in the world is 50 caliber. Um, the everybody over the years has made a 45 caliber and a 50 caliber. Um, the 50 caliber is by far the most popular. Uh, just because there's so many different manufacturers making bullets for that 50 caliber um, platform. Um, and, of course, again, I, I do work for CVA, uh, which we're the number one muzzle manufacturer in the world. And we make three different lines. We make a Wolf, an Optima, and an Acura line. Wolf is more, um, it's a smaller frame gun. Uh, it's more of an entry-level gun, still an amazing shooter. 
um, you know, and they're going to price point $300, give or take, depending on camo or stainless and so on and so forth. Uh, then you got the Optima line, which is kind of mid-grade. They're going to be around $400, give or take. Uh, then the Acura, which is top of the line, it's the XLT version. It's got the adjustable trigger and, uh, you know, the soft touch stock and all this kind of stuff. So it's really the top end. It goes, typically, they're going to be 550 or 600 uh, but, but we manufacture a muzzleloader for anybody's uh, budget uh, and any experience level to get into. And, and by all means, um, muzzleloading by far is my favorite. And I think if, if people don't take advantage of the muzzleloader seasons across this country, uh, they're absolutely missing out because there's a lot of wonderful hunting seasons if you have a muzzleloader in hand. Uh, well, i gotta, I got to ask you another question with this real quick because – Okay. How, how important would you say uh, stainless steel is when you when you buy a muzzler? Because that's I, I have one and I did not get stainless and I think that's one of my bigger regrets. My next one I think will be, um, just because of you know how quickly they the at least mine rusts. Um, I, I, do you okay, think that's so, so important so to the get? the key word in what you, the key word in what you said stainless. Okay, so let's let's keep this in mind. So so you probably have, obviously you have a blued barrel, which is a softer material, which is absolutely going to rust. All black powder is very, very corrosive, with the exception of the newest powder. Of course, I mean, we're on a podcast. This is like major technology here for me. Um, so that, that technology is in everything. Um, so um, black powder substitutes, there's a new powder on the market called Blackhorn 209. It's, it absolutely is the cleanest powder and the closest to smokeless powder you can get. It's, it's, it's not corrosive whatsoever. Um, but so yes, if you had to choose a gun between a blue barrel, which hardly anybody manufactures anymore because of its corrosive nature or, or ability to be um, rusted, um, so stainless steel is the best choice. But there's one thing to keep in mind: in that word stainless steel, what's the first word? Stainless. I'm asking you this question. Yeah. <laughs> stainless. Well, yeah, a trick okay. question here. <laughs> it, it is. It is a trick question. Okay, so it's stainless. It doesn't stay stain proof. It's stain less. So okay. even stainless guns will rust because there's impurities in that metal that will rust. I can promise you, if you take a stainless gun, lay it outside, let it rain on it three days, there will be rust. Now, it'll come off a lot easier. It won't pit as easy. The newest technology out today is called nitride. So, mm -hmm. so like, there's several guns that you'll see, you know, if you Google nitride guns or Google newest muzzleloaders, they're going to look like they're a blue barrel, but they're actually a stainless barrel that has went through a nitride process, which in layman's terms is a salt bath. And these barrels are black, looking like they've either been seracoded or blued. But what happens is when we run them through a salt bath, it pulls the um, carbon out of the barrel, out of the makeup of the of the the stainless steel and brings it to the exterior surface. So I'm sitting here, I, just before we started talking tonight, I, I was putting together a CBA Acura MR for a hunt I'm going to do in Illinois here later on this fall. It, it is camo and black. So it looks like I painted a barrel black or, or uh, Cerakoted it or it's a blue, but it's actually stainless steel that has been nitrided and it is absolutely impervious to weather. It will never corrode, has a 100% lifetime guaranteed never to oxidize any shape, form, or fashion. Um, so the newest thing today, so if you today, you say, man, I want to go get a new muzzle loader, make sure you get one that's been nitrided. Mm -hmm. So like the, so like the, the, the guns that the, that the guys use overseas to protect our tails every day, they got the name called a black gun. Well, it's not black because it's been painted. It's black because it's been through a nitriding process. So we took the technology from, from the, uh, U.S. military forces and, and these AR-15 style guns, these black guns, and bring it into our muzzleloading world. Because if it's good enough for them to use overseas and the mess that they deal with, then we we put it into technology and put it into our muzzleloaders so that they're a lot less corrosive than they've ever been. Yeah. So don't get don't get stained less. Get nitride. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks a lot, well, Tony. Now you got that. me in trouble. Yeah, I'm gonna be spending 400 extra dollars now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to who, it ain't who you are, it's who you know. And you know the guy in the game, my friend, just call me, I hook you up. <laughs> right. well, I might do that, I might do that. <laughs> it's a good thing this podcast well, man, isn't too I, popular, because uh, Traveling Hunter would be blowing up with, oh, I know yes. the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I know the guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> man, 
Hey, man, one of these days, my friend, you got a vision, you'll yeah. be there. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, thanks so much for talking. This is a lot of fun. Thanks for talking to us tonight, Tony. Yes, we hey, appreciate hey, it. Thank you. It's, it's absolutely my pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be on you guys' show. And if I can ever do anything for you in the future, if you want to talk about muzzleloading come muzzleloading season, I'd be glad to do that, too. We might need to do that. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks again, Tony. Absolutely, my friend. You guys take care. And if you need something, call me anytime. All right. Have a safe trip. All right, bud. Take care, Good luck this season. All right. Yes, sir. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Well, that was a fun and entertaining conversation. Where did we leave off on the intro? All right, so uh, let's see. My wife had planned to go out of town and some had some plans changed. So earlier in the week, she was like, oh, you know, we, we might be able to go hunting this weekend. So I you know, didn't want to get too excited about it. Um, but, you know, season here opened, I think, the 17th, and today's the 26th. So, you know, it, I missed the first weekend, was thinking I was going to miss the second one. I had a bunch of trade shows for work. But anything, things worked out. Um, I had to go up uh, Saturday morning. Uh, so basically, it's just going to be you know Saturday evening through Sunday, um, and uh, I decided after I left the house, even I was going to go up to my dad's property, um, which is about an hour away from uh, the, probably an hour and a half from the property I was going to hunt. So I ran up there, stopped and grabbed some seed on the way. I threw some seed down on the food plot, um, mowed it. After that. Um, so what I'm hoping is uh, there was some chicory in there already. I threw down some more chicory and some brassicas. I'm hoping that starts coming up. There's, there's a lot of weeds in there, but I don't want to spray it um, because there's already chicory in it. So hopefully that comes up. Hopefully we get some good rain. Um, rain over to my aunt and uncle's property. And, uh, you know, it's kind of crazy. I'm, I'm used to hunting public land where it's almost like you just kind of, I just kind of would like blaze in there and hunt wherever I wanted um, because I wasn't worried about pressuring the deer anywhere else because who knows what anybody else is going to do. Um, but with my aunt and uncles this year, I'm really trying to keep it, even though it's a lot of property, I don't want the deer to know um, they were being hunted. And it's a new property for me, so I was really having a hard time deciding where to go. Um, but finally, I decided to kind of go back towards the back end of the property and just took a main road in. Um, and I figured it'd be more like an observation set. But really, I'm, at this point, um, just looking for meat for the freezer. So I uh, got to an area where I you know, thought deer could be coming through. It was on like a main road um, and had an idea where I thought they might be headed. Uh, got all set up, got settled in. And uh, not long after I was set up, I actually had a, um, a spike buck and a doe come out actually behind me. And this is interesting. They came up the road on the exact trail that I came in on. And, uh, you know, we just... Were you wearing a scent lock suit? I was not. We just did this <laughs> scent control podcast. Here's, here's what my scent control was. I went and did food plots earlier in the day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, when I got to my aunt and uncle's, I changed clothes into, like, some clothes there on my bag, wore the same boots I had done all that other work in, um, and that's it. I, you know, I don't, it's, you know, uh, I, I guess, you know, I was staying neutral with the, the scent control podcast and I don't necessarily even disagree with everything John's saying with the scent lock suit. Um, my thing is I just don't feel like I can go to those extremes on a regular basis. And he even, I, you know, I was sweating like crazy. It was like 90 degrees. Um, so I kind of feel like for me, I would rather just hunt um and i guess the thing is so i had a spike buck come in and it was probably um, like a two and a half year old doe you know it wasn't you know these weren't mature deer so you know maybe if i was talking a, a five and a half year old buck you know maybe they blow out of there but i can tell you they walked on the exact trail there's a a tree that had fallen over the road from the hurricane and there was a low spot on the tree where you, you had to go over and my thinking was they were going to come from the opposite way i came in on and that was going that's where i you know, had a, about a 20 yard shot. So, um, but what turned out is they just came in on the way I came in and followed, <laughs> followed the easiest way right over the trail. And, and they were eating the whole way. And, um, you know, they didn't, didn't even seem like they noticed at all. So, um, and you know, maybe these deer aren't, aren't as pressured as, as, 
you know, maybe a public land deer would, would have been long gone. I, I don't know. Um, so, but I, what I try to do is set up so they don't walk through where I walk in. Um, you know, I don't count on that happening every time, but, you know, sometimes it does. So anyway, uh, the, the spike buck was in front, and I, I wasn't going to shoot that. Um, just, you know, I'd like to let the, the bucks there get a little bit older, but um, wanted to get some meat for the freezer, so I was waiting on that doe to come up. She came on the same path as the doe after the spike got through. I had that doe at 20 yards. Um, she turned around feeding and was quartered away slightly. And uh, so it gave me a chance to draw back. And they took a while getting in, so I was all settled down. Took the shot, felt good, sounded good. Um, and as soon as I hit her, she, uh, she ran like 50 yards back into the woods. I couldn't see her, but then I heard her start blowing. Um, which man, that was. I feel I, I knew right, my heart kind of sank when I heard her blowing because that's not a good sign. You need you double lung a, a deer; they're not going to start blowing. So, um, but I wasn't sure. And then then she uh, she ran back further in the woods a little bit, and I heard her back in some water, um, and then I didn't hear anything. So, I waited about uh, 20 minutes to get down, um, and it, w it was just about completely dark. I wanted to get down and and. I couldn't see my arrow. I have a Luminoc, but I couldn't see it at all. So I wanted to get down before that, before it got completely dark. Um, went down, checked the arrow, and or checked for the arrow, and actually found the arrow right away. The the lighted knock had lit up. It just wasn't real bright. I couldn't see it from the stand. And that arrow was covered in red. So I went from feeling not so good from hearing her blow to feeling pretty good because, I mean, that arrow looked real good to me. Um, I didn't really see any blubbles or anything in it, so you know I wasn't sure where I hit her. Um, but I did smell the area, and you know, smelt just like blood. Didn't smell any gut or anything like that. Um, so what I did is I, I wanted to just find the first blood. So there was some some blood right where the arrow hit you know, on the ground, and it was splattered right there. It was a complete pass through. The arrow was stuck in the ground. Um, but I had to go back a ways to find my first blood, and I actually couldn't find it until I went to a spot where I had seen her back in the woods a little bit before she ran back in the swamp. Um, so as soon as I found that, I marked it, and then I backed out. Went and got my truck. Probably took me another half hour, so it was probably like a good hour before I started tracking. And uh, the problem is that that blood was, was real thin. Um, so I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Uh, the blood was thin, thinned out real good. I, I tracked probably... 100 yards back into the swamp, and I lost lost the blood trail in the water. Um, I looked for three, four hours. I looked to the point where I felt like if she was laying there dead, the meat was going to be spoiled um, before I quit looking. Um, but I could never find that doe. So that was, that was a real frustrating frustrating part of the weekend. Um, you know, the first thing I was thinking of, oh, what am I going to talk about on the podcast? I got a hunting podcast and, and talk about how I, I messed up a shot on a deer and couldn't find it. But um, I think probably most people listening aren't listening because of my great hunting skills or, or archery skills anyway, and I think hopefully most people can relate. Um, and uh, so that was frustrating, and I kind of told myself I'm not going to let let this ruin hunting, you know, hunting for me because this is a relaxation thing, something I enjoy. But you know, it's hard to just let something like I woke up in the morning just anxious about it. Unfortunately, yeah. um, I think everybody knows the feeling. Um, uh, and I, you know, it was a 20 yard shot. I don't even know exactly what happened. I'm not sure. I mean, the arrow looked real good. I, if I had to guess, I'd say maybe I hit her high and it just went through the back straps and she's, she's probably out there living somewhere. Um, but, but I can't be sure. Um, I'll, uh, I'll post a picture up of the arrow on, maybe I'll put it on our Instagram page. So uh, feel free to comment on it, take a look at it, and see see what you think. If you're, you know, I'd I'd be interested in some listener feedback. I've I've got thick skin. I'm sure there might be some people that might have some negative comments, but I'm sure a lot of you guys guys and gals would be helpful with it. So um, let me know what you think. And uh, but I I so I I didn't hunt the next morning. I was I was didn't get in bed till one o'clock and just you know how I left my stand out there. You know how it is after you. Uh, aren't able to recover a deer, just hard to get as motivated. Um, nope. But I went the night next night, had a great doe step out, and uh, she was she was coming in close. Um, 
but I had a spotted fawn step out right behind her, um, you know, a few seconds after she stepped out. And I've read the QDMA studies that say that fawns um, can survive if, if they're, you know, once hunting season starts. But, man, I'm looking at this thing, and it did not look like it was going to be old enough <laughs> to survive. And, uh, you know, um, I don't know. Maybe it, when it comes to hunting, I wouldn't say I'm real softy or anything. But, man, I I did not feel like I could. As soon as I saw that thing, it was, you know, hopping around and hiding in the bushes. And I couldn't <laughs> oh, shoot. No. Them. That wasn't – it's not for me. So. Well, uh, I was going to say you might have been looking at the wrong deer, just so you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might get some love for that one too. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I, I uh, that 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 was the hunt for the weekend. Yeah, I mean, it was the the weekend was kind of a mess overall. Uh, Sunday morning, my phone just cut out on me, and you know we become so reliant on phones with GPS and weather, and um, I actually had to, I found Wi-Fi somewhere to email my wife and be like, hey, I I don't have I'm not gonna be able to get in touch with you. So what I ended up doing is I was going to stay until Monday morning. And for my job, I make sales calls. So I was going to make sales calls on my way home Monday morning. But I had to change plans and drive straight home Sunday night after the hunt. So I got home, I think, at 1 in the morning uh, Sunday night so I could get up and go to work the next morning. But um, I still wouldn't trade it, you know. I got I got some more property work done. I got some food plots uh, done on, on my aunt and uncle's, too. Uh, which I'm real interested to see what I what what's going to work. So, what I did is I sprayed Roundup, and uh, and and then I sprayed the seed, and I'm going to have somebody mow it for me. So um, it's definitely no-till, and it's going to be I all I used was a backpack sprayer and a hand spreader, and I spread I spread chicory and brassica. So um, I'll try to remember to update everybody, see how well that works because. Um, you know, if that works out, that's a pretty easy way to do a food plot. Um, and, of course, it's with brassicas and stuff, it'll be late season before that's any good. But um, I'm kind of interested to see how that turns out as well. Yeah, me too. I'm not a food plot guy, so I'll definitely take any kind of advice on the, the easy way of doing things. Because yeah. I don't own any, like, heavy equipment or, heck, I don't even have a four-wheeler anymore. So. Well, hopefully that story didn't bore everybody, but I, I think most probably most people can relate to the struggles. So, and you know what's crazy is um, that might be my only hunt with a bow this year, um, <laughs> because the you know with with the family and the the long mm-hmm. drive and all that, there's no hunting during the week, um, and the bow season here is about a month long before we get actually into muzzle loader, um, and I've got a muzzle loader and and I'll tell you what I'm I enjoy bow hunting, but I enjoy muzzle loader hunter. I enjoy gun hunting. If if it's in season, that's what kind of hunting I'm doing right now. I'm I'm not to the point in my hunting career where it's you know I feel like I need to place more limitations on myself. Um, so uh, anyway, when, once those other seasons roll around, I'm gonna be doing that other stuff as well. So um, anyway, that not the greatest way I wanted my bow season to go, and and hopefully I can get out one more time before the season's up. Um, I think there's still another two weeks left in it about. Um, so we'll see. Um, but if not, I know there's uh, plenty other good hunting coming up for me. Well, as a wise turkey hunter once told me, if you have not missed a turkey, you're not a real turkey hunter. And so I think I could use the same thing with uh, bow hunting. If you haven't shot a deer and, and wounded and missed and, you know, and lost one, unfortunately, it's just part of it. It's, it's going to happen. I hope it doesn't happen often. I hope it doesn't happen to me ever again. I hope it doesn't happen to you ever again. And, you know, I wish we could all just make perfect shots but the unfortunate thing is it, it does happen and man i hate to hear it and it's uh it can weigh on you negatively hope that it does not and uh, you can kind of get past it hopefully the the doe is still running around in that cotton mouth alligator infested swamp down <laughs> yeah, there in florida yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and if not there's plenty of coyotes around i'm sure i'm sure yeah. you know they made quick work of her but you know i'm not out there yeah. to feed the coyotes um but you know what? I wouldn't, t- you know, if I didn't feel confident in, in doing it, I, you know, I, it's not a shot I would take. Um, you know, it's not no. something I take lightly. Um, we talked about it before. Time, I mean, that was yeah. like a perfect shot. I yes. mean, that though you said 20 yards broadside, a little bit quarter and away. I mean, you can't hardly beat that. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, you know, I don't have a ton of bow hunting on my belt, but I, like I said, I, that was a 20 yard. Sh- I, 
I feel good doing that all day. So uh, yeah. I can't tell you what went wrong. I, I don't know exactly. Um, but I guess I just got to live with it and, and uh, just keep mov- moving forward with it. Yep, definitely. So uh, hopefully you can get, get, some, get on the board for the Down South Hunting Podcast for us. Um, I know, man. Yeah. Looks like I'm up to bat next. Yeah. So get out there this weekend and stick me a fat doe. I'm just always, you know what? I'm always so hesitant to shoot a doe this time of year because it's so stinking hot. And it's like if you do make a suspect shot where you need to let one lay, you don't want, want to do that because the meat's ruined. So I'm always just kind of up in the air. If I want to shoot one this time of year, then I'll always wait till it gets to November. And then I'm like, I'm not shooting a doe in November. The rut's <laughs> on. And then I'm like, I wait all the way through November, and by the December, uh, our deer are so pressured, it's like, oh, dang gum, you know, should I shoot one now? And uh, that's when I end up taking one out. But if I can find the right pl- stand to go to this weekend, a place where I, I feel comfortable shooting her and, and being able to recover, and it's it's just on these this WMA I'm hunting now, it's so so much water and swamp like you're talking about. Man, it's just I'm afraid of losing one at this point. So yeah. now you've got me even more hesitant but uh i might maybe i'll track down home or something and possibly do that where i i got some land to run around on and i know the place yeah anyways cool man well you know it's fun to just kind of get back in the role with these things um you know i'm i'm looking forward to some of the other guests we got coming up and um hey if uh for for the listeners if um if you if you get a deer or something you want to share it with us uh you know, send us a picture on social media or something. We'd love to get some down, down south hunting, you know, deer on the board. So maybe if Adam and I can't do it, we can get some listeners to help us out. And uh, we <laughs> yeah. can share those on social media as well. Um, so yeah, if I guess Milton tag us in your pictures action. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's, man, it's hunting season. I'm excited about it. So I feel, like, I feel like that story is leaving things on a down note. But, man, I'm pumped that it's hunting season. I can't wait to get back out there. Like I said, I'm not going to let this ruin my love for hunting. You know, it's one, one small part that's, you know, a tough thing that we all know we got to live with sometimes. Um, but, man, it's, this is it. This is, you know, this is uh, my favorite time of the year, and, and we're in it. So I'm, I'm just going to enjoy it. Um, while we're talking about that real quick, let yeah. me get a word in for um, hunting gear deals. Um, the site has been blowing up, been getting tons more sales lately. Thank you so much for everybody that's been visiting, especially when you're looking to buy something. Um, I, I think I'm actually at the point where the site is actually going to turn a profit this year. So I really appreciate everybody's help, and I need that to happen for me to be able to keep putting time and energy into that site. Um, so thank you so much for everybody doing that. Um, and I know it's been able to help a lot of people out. Um, just by the amount of sales going through it and the traffic going up. So uh, keep doing it, and thank you so much for the people that have in the past as well. And let me leave something on a high note. The item, my last item that I bought off of Hunting Gear Deals, my trail camera, my I'm going to call it the mystery trail camera. It's out on this new private property I have. This camera is set up on a fence line, kind of in a pinch point, right in a saddle, like right up against it, in a saddle. So I haven't checked that thing since like late July or early August. And I have, I'm, yeah, I can't man. wait to Who get out there and check it, it out. So yeah, <laughs> I know, man, I'm excited about that. That, that, and you know, here's the bad part is I didn't calibrate it or whatever you call it, where you put, you get a, the date, the date and the time stamp. So I'm going to have no clue when these deer are coming and going. Oh, right. Because so that camera gonna, was a deal. It was like a $30 camera. Right. So it doesn't yeah. have to, Yeah. I don't, I don't even know if it has it. I got out there and I was like, dang, I mean, I didn't read the instructions. So I threw the batteries in there, <laughs> made sure it took a picture and walked off. So uh, let's just, I got my fingers crossed that there's some massive monster buck running around this area where no other hunter has a, has had a tree stand on this private property. So I am very pumped about that. Yeah, so I need, maybe I can get out there and check that sucker out. Well, you know, the good thing is you don't need to have pattern to buck back in July anyway. You know, so you no, don't really need to know, you just need to know he's there. So, yeah. uh, yeah, man, that's exciting. I'm, I'm excited about hearing it. I got a bunch of cameras out of my aunt and uncles and I checked two of them. One, actually they both had issues. So, but I probably have six or seven more and that's how serious I am about not pressuring the deer out there is I didn't even check those other cameras. I'm going to wait till I'm in the area to hunt. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to do things right out there. We'll see how it turns out. Hopefully, uh. It turns out with uh, 
some mature bucks on the ground this year. And I can't wait to get my kids out there either. I'm excited that about will that. Be. So. That will be fun. All right, man. I, I think we probably ought to wrap it up. We've been on the phone forever. And uh, yeah, we've been, it's almost, uh, we're getting close to two hours here. So uh, hopefully, if, if you can't stand Adam and I talking, you stopped listening a long time ago. And For uh, real. if you enjoy it, hopefully we helped you waste a bunch of your work time today or something like that. So. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, I guess I guess with that we're uh, we're out down south. Out down south. See you, Mike. See ya.